You've heard us many times in this ministry say that the gospel is from Genesis to Revelation. Throughout the Bible, no matter where you read, it seems like it begins right there in Genesis. And it's interesting that when we read the book of Genesis, we may not think of this, but we see that angels are directly involved in many things that take place on this earth, even in the book of Genesis. Many of us forget sometimes that it was an angel that shows up in the Garden of Eden that tempted Eve and that tempted Adam. Of course, this was an angel that had, in his mind, he had fallen. But an angel was there in the book of Genesis. We also see that uh, when we look at that, we see that in Genesis, we see that there, the salvation was lost, but salvation was gained also. We see the first prophecy in Genesis 3.15. And then we see that when Adam and Eve had sinned, that there were angels posted at the gate, the entrance to the garden, so that they couldn't enter and eat from that tree of knowledge, or the tree of life, rather, and be immortal sinners. God used angels to block the entrance to that garden. Angels are involved in our lives, whether we realize it or not. Some people, we don't think of angels as being involved on a regular basis in our lives. I think, and this is something that we need to consider. How involved are they? How does God use angels? Well, we know that uh, Satan is spoken of in uh, 2 Corinthians as an angel of light. The name Lucifer means light bearer. And this is the very one that initially turned on God because of the things that the duties, the responsibilities, because of his beauty, because of his splendor, he turned his love inward, a form of self-worship, a form of idolatry, and it caused him to fall. What we learn about angels in that regard is that God doesn't take our free will. He doesn't take the free will of the angels. We've talked about this a number of times. Sometimes angels are called cherubim. It was cherubim that were stationed at the garden. Sometimes they're called seraphim. Some of the angels have names as we read through the Bible. And we find that the uh, cherubim, according to the Bible, have two wings. And seraphim, according to the Bible, have six wings. So are these just fictitious characters? Or do they really exist? Well, if I take the Bible as literal, which I do, I have to believe that they literally exist. And they are very involved in ministering. They're very involved in ministry. They are as involved today, maybe more so today, than they were at the beginning of the time when, when we were humans were created. And these powerful ministering spirits appear from Genesis all the way through Revelation. And we see that. And sometimes we read and we don't even think about those things. All through Bible history we find them. Uh, many times they're seen as protecting and guiding God's people. Sometimes they're seen as fulfilling a punishment that God has met it out. For, for example, in 2 Kings chapter 19, it talks about this one angel that slayed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers at God's will. They do the things God asked them to do. Angels have also been used as God's messengers of prophecy in very important times in history. You say, angels reveal prophecy? Well, yes, they do. They absolutely do. In Genesis 19, who was it that warned Lot? Wasn't it angels that came to Lot and, and warned him about what was going to come? Isn't that a prophecy? Hey, the city's going to be destroyed. That's a prophecy. The city's going to be destroyed. You need to get out of here. Angels came to Lot to warn him. In the book of Luke, the angel Gabriel, an angel with a name, came to Mary and told her she was going to have a child. This virgin woman. Angels are involved in prophecy. Did you realize that the Bible teaches that in the end of time, which I believe this is a time that we're living, that in the end of time, this world as we know it, God will send vital messages to humanity, not just by his spirit, 
but by angels. We forget these things. We forget them, and that can make us sometimes overlook or not see things that God's trying to tell us. If we don't realize that the angels are directly involved in things, we can be lost. In Revelation chapter 14, God reveals vital messages for people living in the last days. Brother Rick read a text, and I don't know if you caught it or not, for some of you who maybe haven't looked at that text in a specific way, but there are vital messages for people that are living in the last days of this world's history. And these messages are so significant that Jesus will not return until those things are actually fulfilled. And you might say, well, that's kind of hard to believe. So let's begin. We're going to begin by asking and answering a question about the Bible book of Revelation. Because we said that angels exist, we, that we see them in the very first chapters of the Bible, but we also see them in the last chapters of the Bible, and many, many places in between. So we're going to kind of do this in a question-answer format, just to get the mind stimulated, to cause you to think a little bit. Our first question, should Christians study Revelation? Isn't it sealed? Now, many people believe that Revelation is a sealed book. They believe that it's, it's difficult to understand, which I will admit, it is difficult to understand. But is it sealed? Well, let's let the Bible interpret itself. In the, in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 10, it says, And he said to me, Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. So while the book of Revelation and Daniel, as we've discussed many times before, they go hand in hand, let's not confuse God's words to Daniel with God wants to reveal to us. You see, Daniel was told this. You see what we look at it here in Revelation again. Do not seal the words of the prophecy of this book. But in Daniel, Daniel was told this in Daniel 12.4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So we see in the book of Daniel, Daniel was told to seal the book. He didn't understand everything that was going on. In Revelation, we're told, do not seal the book. Notice, too, that in Daniel, when does it say to seal the book? Until? Until the time of the end. Most of us as Christians believe that we're living in the time of the end. So these things should be openly and more and more revealed to us as we read and study. Does it appear to you that we're living in the time of the end? When you look around, do you see things being fulfilled that are in Bible prophecy, in the Bible, more than ever before? Let me ask you, this text says, uh, knowledge shall increase. The last few words of that, of that text there in Daniel 12.4. Has knowledge increased? It doesn't say wisdom. It says knowledge, and knowledge has increased. Knowledge is abundant, and knowledge doesn't necessarily mean wisdom. You can have knowledge of something, but it doesn't mean that you have wisdom. So keep that in mind, because knowledge will increase. And we've talked about this over the past few weeks. You know, there are many things that will distract us. Knowledge can take us away from the Word of God and take us away from the wisdom of God. But knowledge can also benefit us in many ways. Revelation, this book of Revelation, has never been a sealed book, as was Daniel. Daniel was told to seal up the book. Daniel was written approximately 600 B.C. The book of Revelation was written approximately 90 to 100 A.D., or we could say during the Common Era. So the book of Revelation has never been sealed, as was Daniel. The very name Revelation means unveiling. It means revealing. It means opening or knowing. So by its very name, it's not a sealed book. It's the opposite of being sealed. The book of Revelation begins this way. I want you to notice Revelation chapter 1 on the PowerPoint. It says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him, this is verse 1, to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it, how? By his angel. There we have it. We have an angel right there in the book of Revelation in the first chapter, in the first verse, to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Now, when John was penning these words in about 90 or so AD, and he was saying the time is near, is it nearer now? It's a little nearer now, I would say. You say, see, Revelation even gives us a word picture of Jesus. In Revelation chapter 1, the same chapter, verses 13 through 16. Notice what this says. In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were, like, were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Now, there's a lot that you could unpack in just these few verses. We're not going to unpack that today, but let me just point out a couple of things to you if you look at, this verse, at these verses again. It says, in the midst of seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about his chest with a golden band. We're told in the Bible that Jesus is the express image of his Father's person in Hebrews chapter 1. In Psalm 104, we're told that the Father is, has a garment of righteousness. So here we see that Jesus is pictured with a garment down to the feet. In verse 14, it says, and his head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace. We're told in the Bible that Jesus learned obedience. He was refined. He was a human being. He learned obedience. It doesn't mean that he sinned. He learned obedience by listening to his Father, knowing what his Father desired, not doing his own desires. And a lot of these things, as you read through this text, you find that a lot of these things are, are told what they mean as we read through Revelation. We find more meaning to this. But no other book of the Bible reveals Jesus and God's last day instructions and their plans as does this book of Revelation. Revelation is written primarily for people that are living during the last days, just before Jesus returns. I believe that's us. I believe that's now. I want you to notice Revelation chapter 3, verse 11. It says, Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. And then Revelation chapter 22. Notice this. Revelation 22, 6 and 7. It says, Then he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angels or since his angel, there it is again, an angel, to show his servants the things which must shortly take place. Behold, I am coming quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. So it is important, is it important that we understand Revelation, that we know what it means, that we know who it's speaking to, that we see that angels are involved? You notice it used angel again in this particular text. Notice verse 12 of the same chapter, chapter 22. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to just a few. No, to give to everyone according to his work. So this means that in order to have a work, we must know what that work is, and we must be doing that work. Well, what is that work? We'll find out as we go through this lecture this morning. Another question we need to answer in Matthew 24, verse 14, Jesus said the gospel would go out to the whole world. Does Revelation speak about this? Well, let's begin by highlighting a couple of things. First of all, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 14, it says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. Well, this is part of that work that we were talking about, the preaching of the gospel, getting the message, the importance of the message. And notice that it says, 
that the gospel will be preached in all the world, and then the end will come. If you remember, I said at the outset that the message that these angels are delivering and that we deliver can prolong the coming of Jesus if we're not actively doing so. He has to wait until these things are done according to the Father's will and His will. So again, we see, I want you to notice Matthew 24, 14, because we're going to look at this and contrast it with Revelation 14. It says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. And then Revelation 14, and I, I took the liberty of taking three verses and combining them, just to give you a little context here. It says, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach, and another angel followed, saying, and then we see a third angel also followed them. So are angels involved in ministry? This is all about preaching the gospel in the context of Revelation 14, as we will see. We're going to see these verses in just a moment. We're going to look at them. But the word angel that you see here in these texts, all of these words that are used there for angel, literally means messenger. An angel is simply a messenger. Well, what does that mean? That means that the Greek word that's used there for angel, if, if you are proclaiming the gospel to me, you're a messenger. In the Bible, men sometimes are called angels. So just because we hear the word angel, we shouldn't always equate that with these winged creatures that God created that we can't see. You know, sometimes we're told in the Bible that we could entertain, we could be entertaining angels, and it could be those. But the same with Lot. Was Lot not entertaining angels? Yes, he was. Yes, he was. So when we know that this word angel literally means messenger, it makes it fitting that God uses angels or messengers to symbolize the preaching of his gospel message for the last days. According to Revelation 14, there are angels involved in helping us to preach the gospel to the world. So let's turn our Bibles to Revelation chapter 14. And there's a lot here. We're not going to cover all of this. One thing I would like to make clear, we have already talked about the fact that Revelation is an end time book. It is written for people of the end times. And in the context of Revelation 14, if, even if you start in verse 1, all of this is according to the end of time, at the closing of this world's history. Now, keep in mind that the book of Revelation is not written in chronological order. So sometimes it will tell you about a whole process of things that will happen as if they have happened. And then later on, it seems, well, this is before that. This should be placed before that what we just read. You'll see that a lot in Revelation. You see that a lot in the Old Testament as well. You'll see things and say, oh, wait a minute. It already talked about this in Genesis chapter 2, but here I have it again in Genesis chapter 3. You will see that. So don't be confused by those things. But what I want to do is I want to focus specifically on Revelation chapter 14, beginning in verse 6. And we're just going to read uh, verses 6 through 13. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. So we notice there that this angel is preaching the everlasting gospel. He has that gospel with him to preach to those on the earth, to everyone, not just a few, to every person, every being. Verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she has made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. 
and the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. So this raises a question. And here's the question we want to answer. What two crucial points does Revelation 14 verse 6 reveal about God's message for the last days? We're looking for two points, two specific points. So let's look at the verse on the PowerPoint. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Do you see the points there? Well, if you don't, let me highlight one for you. One of them is they have the everlasting gospel. This is most important, the gospel, because this is what points us to Christ Jesus. This is the only way to salvation. So not only do we, they have the everlasting gospel, but notice the next point. To preach to those to dwell, who dwell on the earth. Not just your neighbor, not just your relative, but to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. What do people need to know? Well, let's let the Bible tell us. Acts chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. It says, Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel... By the name, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there any salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This is vital that we know Jesus Christ, that we know him. And you notice, how, how does it start? A lot of people will say, well, these things are for the nation of Israel. What's it say? Let it be known to you all, only the nation of Israel? No, it says to you all and to all the people of Israel. So it's for everyone, Jew and Gentile. They also must know this. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I, this is Jesus speaking, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus says. Jesus is the only way to the Father. Jesus is the truth. No other way to salvation exists except by Jesus. We read that in the previous verse that we read. Remember, Jesus is the way, the truth. It doesn't say your church is truth. It doesn't say your pastor is truth. It doesn't say the minister that you like to hear preach is truth. It doesn't say that any denomination or organization is truth. Jesus is the truth. When people refer to their church or their denomination or their organization as the truth, it's a slap in the face of the Son of God. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to eternal life. You know, the devil has many, many counterfeits. And there are two which he uses that are very effective. We've talked about two in the past, but now we're going to look at two different ones. One that we've talked about in the past was he likes to wreak havoc on the marital arrangement, and he likes to wreak havoc, havoc on the Sabbath by creating a false Sabbath. But there are two counterfeits that are very effective that he uses. And you may not have considered this before. One of them is this. Salvation by works. I must do, do, do. I have to do this. I have to do that. And this is how I get my salvation. If I'm not doing enough of this or that, then I'm not going to get there. This is a counterfeit. We're not saying that there aren't things you have to do. But Satan loves to twist things. He loves to counterfeit things. And remember, for everything that is real, Satan has a counterfeit. And you can't have a counterfeit of something that doesn't exist. 
For example, in the United States of America, we don't have a $3 bill. So if we don't have a $3 bill, I can't have a counterfeit $3 bill because a counterfeit is passing something off that is actually real. A $3 bill in the United States of America is just a phony bill. It's just fake. And every American knows that. But you can have a counterfeit $5 bill because there is a $5 bill. And the counterfeit is to be passed off as the genuine. So remember, this counterfeit that Satan is passing off is salvation by works. Another counterfeit is salvation in sin. Salvation in sin. And let me tell you, the vast majority of Christians fall for, for this particular one. I probably should have put these, inverted them. I probably should have put salvation in sin as number one. Because this is what the vast majority of Christians fall for. These two counterfeits are uncovered and revealed in the book of Revelation, specifically in chapter 14. And many, without realizing it, have embraced one or both of these errors and are trying to build their salvation upon either by works, by what they do, or by trying to do so while living in sin. I know people who, uh, they're living together, they're couples that are not married, and they go to church every week, and they believe that everything is okay. Well, the Lord forgives me. The Lord loves me. He wants me in His kingdom, and I'm just fine because I come and I ask for forgiveness. That's salvation in sin. That's what that is. You see, Jesus came to save us from our sins, not in our sins. You've heard me say that. You're going to hear me say that over and over over the years. So, because this is something that a lot of preachers will not preach. They won't touch these subjects with a 10-foot pole. They won't tell the people in the congregation what needs to be heard because they're afraid that they'll walk out the door. Well, you know what? It doesn't matter if they walk out that door or not, so long as they walk through the door, which is Jesus Christ. That's what matters. That's the door we don't want to walk out of, is Christ Jesus. So we have to stress that no one is truly preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ in the end time who does not include the message of Revelation chapter 14, which is the everlasting gospel. It's not just the gospel for now. It's the everlasting. That means it lasts forever. And it will always be so. So there are messages from three angels that we find in Revelation chapter 14. So here's the next question we want to address. Now we've talked that there are three angels there, but there are what four distinctive points does the first angel's message cover? I don't know if we've ever broken it down like this before, but there are four distinctive points that, that the first angel's message covers. And let's look at them. Uh, here's Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. So the first point is to what? Fear God. There you go. I heard somebody say it. To fear God. There it is highlighted on the PowerPoint. And this doesn't mean you have a trepidation of God. I think sometimes we should. <laughs> But this fear of God that this is talking about is a reverence for God, a fear of displeasing Him, to look upon God with love, with trust, with respect, a fear of not doing the things that He asks us to do. He doesn't force you, He asks you. In fact, Proverbs 6.16 says the following, By mercy and truth iniquity is atoned for, and by fear of Jehovah men depart from evil. You notice... That doesn't say you continue in your evil, you depart from it. It's not salvation in sin. You have to depart from the evil. We depart from it. Solomon said these words in Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Now I want to stop there for just a second. I know I blacked out your screen. I did that so that Zach would turn back to me. It shocked him. He looked at the screen like something went wrong. Uh, I have a blackout button here. You didn't know that, did you? <laughs> so uh, what it says in that text, it's 
oops, uh, there we go. And you don't have to show it, but it says the conclusion of the whole matter. Solomon had just said all, expounded all of these things in Ecclesiastes. And after he says, this wise man, after he says all of these things, this is how he concludes it. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. It, said, let us hear, it says, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is man's awe. The King James says this is the whole duty of man. Verse 14, for God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. So we must put away sin. We have to, get, we have to be a new man. We have to be a new person. We have to give our life to Christ Jesus. To put away sin. So the first distinctive point that we covered, these, of these four distinctive points in the three angels' message, number one is fear God. That's the first one that's addressed. The second distinctive point is give glory to him. There it is on the PowerPoint. I highlighted it. So it says, saying with a loud voice, number one, fear God and give glory to him. We fulfill this command when we praise God, when we thank him, when we obey him. He wants obedience and not sacrifice, right? When we, when we thank him and obey him and we praise him for the good things that he's done for us, when we praise him for giving us his son, We're warned how people are going to be in the last days, and this is not going to be them. Most people are not going to fear God, and most people are not going to give glory to God. In fact, the Bible says quite the opposite. In 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, it says, But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. So we cannot give glory to God if we were doing any of the things that are listed here in 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. This takes away from God. And if we're doing these things and we claim and we profess to be pleasing God and we profess, well, Christ has me covered, you see, that's believing that we have salvation in sin. We have to put these things away. So remember, we're looking for four distinctive points that are found in the first angel's message of Revelation chapter 14. And the first two, as we've discovered, or fear God and give glory to God. The third distinctive point is here. The hour of his judgment is come. This indicates that everyone is accountable to God. Everyone is. And it's clear that this statement is just before Jesus returns. That just before he returns, the judgment will be complete. What do we mean by that? Before Jesus comes, the judgment is complete? Of course. Jesus has to know who is safe to save, as our sister Sherry likes to put it. In other words, when Jesus comes back, he has to know who are his and who are not. Who are my father's children and who are not my father's children? He must know that. So judgment is done before Jesus comes back. And a lot of people don't realize this. A lot of people think that judgment is when he comes. No, judgment is done. So this, what does that mean? I'm sealed before Jesus comes. And if I'm sealed before Jesus comes, that means that my life better be right before I see him coming in the clouds. Because then it's too late. It's too late before that. You've heard me say it. I feel like I say it every Sabbath. Every time I give a sermon, I feel like I say this. But I don't know when my life is going to end. Our brother Thunder avoided an accident last night, we were told. And they're grateful that he wasn't involved. They realized this morning that could have happened at that very moment. That could have been the last breath that that brother took. So 
his destiny would have been sealed at that moment. Well, when Christ comes back, his judgment is done, and he knows who are his and who are not. A number of translations here. You notice in Revelation 14, 7, and I quoted this from the King James, if you look at that, it says, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Well, the New King James says, has come instead of is come. Either way, it's telling us that judgment is done before Jesus comes back. It has to be. So, so far we've seen three points within the first angel's message of Revelation 14. Fear God, give glory to God, the hour of his judgment has come, and that is before Christ comes back. How long before? The Bible doesn't tell us, but it happens before. And the fourth one is worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. This is very, very significant. You see, this particular commandment to worship the one who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and the fountains of waters, this command rejects all forms of idolatry. You can't possibly be an idolater if you're following this command. And this includes self-worship. What is self-worship? It's putting myself before God. It's saying, well, you know, I realize that the will of God is for me to do this, but I'm going to do this instead. You see, what did Jesus do? He said, Father, I don't want to do my will. I want to do your will. So, if it's your will, let this cup be removed from me, but not my will, but yours, right? He, so it's interesting, the examples that Jesus gives us, that simple prayer can help us to overcome things at a, in a desperate moment in our life. No matter how desperate the situation, if we have that prayer, it can help us at that moment. But that means that I have to be willing to give up something in my life that I want to do. I love the way our sister Mary said that to her husband Rick before they were husband and wife. Don't you think God has a better plan for your life than you do? You see, that's trusting it. That's owning God. That's, 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 that's own, owning it, trusting God, putting our hope in Him instead of ourselves. Because if I put it in myself, that's self-worship. And that I can't be following this distinctive point if I put myself before God. I can't do it. So this command to, to worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters is rejecting all kinds of idolatry, and it renounces the theory of even evolution, which denies that there is a creator. That's idolatry. If I'm denying the creator, it's idolatry. You see, the gospel includes the creation and redemption of the world by God through his Son. God created it. He wanted us to live forever. Mankind fell. He redeems them. And he says, all I'm asking in that redemption is that you trust me and trust my Son, and I'll get you through it. Worshiping the Creator includes Resting on the day that God set aside as the memorial of rest. Doing anything outside of that is idolatry. That's okay. I'll keep my own day. Well, as long as I keep one and seven. No, God didn't say keep one and seven. He said the seventh day, the Sabbath day. He made it holy. But no, I, I, yeah, it's a holy day. I believe that. But, you know, I'm going to keep uh, Tuesday instead because that's the day I'm off of work. And that works for me. It gets personal, doesn't it? It gets very personal. People don't like that. Well, I, I didn't like that. So what is that? Now I'm back into the idolatry again. I'm putting myself before God. Notice that Revelation 14, 7 refers to the seventh-day Sabbath in the words. Take a look. I'm going to highlight it for you. Here we go. He made, it says, worship him that made heavens that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. These words come right out of the Sabbath commandment, and a lot of people don't realize that. Exodus 20, verse 11. So again, look at Revelation 14, 7. 
on that slide, and you can keep it on that slide for me, Zach. It says, worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And in Exodus 20, verse 11, it says, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Does that look familiar? It's very similar, isn't it? So the fourth distinctive point of the first angel's message is worship him. That is worship God. Put him before anything. That's what worship is. That's what worship is. So we see those four distinctive points. Fear God, give glory to God, the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him. Four distinctive points by that first angel. So the next question. What solemn statement does the second angel make about Babylon? What does the angel of Revelation 18 urge God's people to do? I know that's Revelation 18, we're in Revelation 14, but I put this together for a reason. So here's the answer. Revelation 14, 8. And another angel followed, this is the second angel, saying, Babylon is fallen is fallen, that great city. When I couple this with Revelation 18, verses 1, 2, and 4, we looked at this, uh, we may have looked at this a little earlier. I saw another angel coming down from heaven, and he cried mighty with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people. Now, I, I took those verses and consolidated them. That's Revelation 18, verses 1, 2, and 4. And I just kind of consolidated them there. But the second angel states that Babylon is fallen. And the voice from heaven urges all of God's people to come out of this thing called Babylon. Babylon is false religion. And if they're part of Babylon, if they stay in Babylon, they will be destroyed along with it. The Bible makes that very clear. So unless you know what Babylon is, you could easily end up being a part of it or staying in it. And if I'm not keeping the, if not, I'm not doing those four distinctive points of the first angel's message, I'm a part of Babylon. You know, some of us are in Babylon and we don't realize it. I was in Babylon and I didn't realize it. I thought I had the truth. I thought my church was the truth and I thought I was safe. But you know, if you are there and you really want the truth of God's word, if you are in any belief structure and you're worried that you might be a part of Babylon, ask God to reveal it to you, and he will. He will find you where you are. He will meet you where you are. And he will bring you to a knowledge of what the Bible says. So the next question we need to answer. Against what does the third angel's message solemnly warn? Let's take a look. Revelation 14, 9 and 10. A third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So this third angel's message warns people against worshiping the beast and his image and receiving the mark of the beast in their forehead or on their hand. So in order to know this, I have to be able to identify the beast. I have to know what the mark is. You see, the first angel commanded true worship, and the third angel tells us the consequences that are connected with false worship. Do you know for certain who the beast is? And if you don't, don't you think you should? Lest you receive its mark? Do you know what the mark of the beast is? And if you don't, don't you think you should? You know, we've taken pains in this ministry to help people to know and see and point out from the Bible what these things are. A lot of people worship the beast and don't even realize it. But remember, God winks at us in our times of ignorance, but that does not mean you omit it. That means that we should study to know it. We've given a number of lectures on the beast, the beast power, the mark of the beast, who is the beast power? And I, I suggest that you study your Bible and let the Bible tell you these things and know it from a historical, literal point of view. If you accept the Bible as history 
and you know history, it will line up and it will make sense to you and you will get the sense of it. Our next question, what four-point description does God give in Revelation 14, 12 of his people who accept and follow the three angels' messages? Now, first of all, if we're going to follow an angel, we want to make sure that it's an angel from God, right? And how do I know that? The Bible, we just read the text in Sabbath school this morning, you test the spirits, right? So if they're telling us anything contrary to God's word, then it can't be one of God's angels. It has to be a fallen angel. So again, let's look at that question. What four-point description does God give in Revelation 14, 12 of his people who accept and follow the three angels' messages? Let's take a look. Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So we see, number one, patience. Number two, they are saints or God's people. Number three, it's highlighted for you, they keep the commandments of God. And number four, they have the faith of Jesus. I have very little patience. I have to work on that, don't I? But it says, here's the patience of the saints. Sometimes my patience is so little that I wonder if I am a saint. But you know, we're, we're called to be God's people. And a lot of people think of saints as this special class of Christian. But if you're one of God's people, you are a saint. It's just that simple. But here's the patience of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God. Not just two or three, not just five or six, not just nine, but ten of the commandments. God wrote them with his finger. And the faith, it doesn't say and have faith in Jesus, but have the faith of Jesus. We've, we've talked about that a lot in this ministry, having the faith of Christ, trusting his Father like Christ trusted his Father. We need faith in Jesus, but we also need the faith of Jesus. So the next question, what happens immediately following the teaching of the three angels' messages to all people? Let me ask you first, do you think that the three angels' message, that these messages are going out to people today, is the gospel being preached in all the world? It is. More now than ever before. There's, you know, I was talking to somebody just the other day, and I said there's no excuse for anyone who says, I don't have a Bible or I, I don't have access to a Bible. There's, there's no reason why anyone can't have access to a Bible unless there's a language issue, and maybe it's not in their language. But the Bible is being published in more languages than any book in the world. No other book is more publicized than the Bible and is made available in more languages than the Bible. And anybody who has access to a smartphone, which is the majority of the world today, I realize that a lot of people are poor, maybe they don't have those things. If they don't have the printed page, then they can have it on their phone free of charge. There are hundreds of programs that will give that to you. So here's the question again. What happens immediately following the teaching of the three angels' messages to all people? Again, to all people. So what do we have to actively be doing? Preaching to people. We can cause Christ to come back sooner if we get this work done. He's given us a work to do. Let's do it. Let's get it done. So what happens immediately following? Revelation 14, 14. Then I looked and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown. When the gospel reaches the whole world, Jesus will return on the clouds to receive people to the heavenly courts for the thousand years. We're told that in Revelation 20. I know a lot of people say, well, no, we're going to be on the earth during the thousand years, but I recommend that you study Revelation chapter 20, and you'll see what the Bible says. I've given a number of lectures about this. In fact, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 gives us a description of what takes place. So let's open our Bibles there. Let's open to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And notice what it says. I'm going to begin in verse 15. It says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, is that yet future? Yes. Where will we be at the coming of the Lord if he comes in our day? We'll be right here on the earth. 
So again, I'm going to start over. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself, that's Jesus Christ, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall remain on the earth forever. No. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. This is at the coming of Jesus, which occurs before the thousand years. So during the thousand years, according to this and according to Revelation 20 and a number of other texts, we will be in the heavenly courts during the thousand years, and then after that, We'll come back to the earth. The earth will, this is, will be our forever home, will be the earth. The earth was not made to not be inhabited. It was made to be inhabited, but things have changed due to sin. And I know that may rub some people wrong when I say that, but we have to preach what the Bible teaches and have to get away from our own ideas sometimes. This was a big change for me and what my belief was, was because I once believed that I would spend that thousand years here on the earth. That's, that's what I believed. But if I allow the Bible to interpret itself, it makes it very clear what takes place during that time. So let's uh, take a look at the next question. In 2 Peter chapter 1, the apostle speaks of present truth. What does he mean? You know, some people, present truth, what? Present truth? What is that? What is present truth? Well, let's have a look at this text in context. Let's uh, turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll turn there together. 2 Peter chapter 1. And let me see here, make sure I'm in the right place. Yes, this is where I want to be. And I'm just going to, I'm just going to start with verse 1, just because. I could start somewhere else, but let's just begin in verse 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and, sa and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, I want to stop there because listen to how the New King James reads. I just read it, but I, I stumbled there because I know what I wanted it to say and what the King James says, and that's why I stumbled there. It says, to those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, guess what? It's missing a word. Because of the agenda of men, the New King James is missing a word in this text because they're trying to make a doctrine out of something that never existed. And that doctrine is this false triune God. Because here's what it should say. To those who have obtained like precious faith with us by the righteousness of our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. The word our is missing. That one little word changes everything. Because we have God, God is a Savior, but Christ is our Savior. And that's why when you read this, knowing that can make all the difference in the world. I just wanted to point that out because these things happen, unfortunately, in translations. Verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of, Christ, and of Jesus our Lord. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So again, we're seeing we can't have salvation in sin because it says here that we're partakers of the divine nature. It doesn't say we become divine, but we become partakers of the divine nature of Christ. And what does that do? It helps us to escape the corruption of the world, to escape the corrupted things I want to do if I trust in him. Verse 5. But also for this very reason, saying, all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, 
you will neither you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So again, leaving the sin. None of these things are talking about sinful nature. It's talking about giving up that sinful tendency that I have. Letting it go. Verse 9, For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. <laughs> I have to be cleansed. And the only way that can happen is in Christ Jesus. It can't happen any other way. Verse 10, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. So it's not talking about being saved by works. It's talking about having being saved by Christ and having the works because of Christ. So remember those two things we were talking about. Salvation by works is, a, is a, one of those counterfeits that Satan has and salvation in sin. This is speaking completely against those two things. Completely against it. Verse 11. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And here's the verse I wanted to focus on, but I, I had to read that. I wanted to read those because it, it really drives home the, the angel's message in Revelation 14. It really brings it into focus. Notice, remember, we asked the question. The question that I asked was in 2 Peter chapter 1, the apostle speaks of present truth. What does he mean by that? Verse 12 says, For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the Present truth. What does that mean? Present truth. Here it is. I'm going to put it on the PowerPoint for you, and I highlighted the word. Present truth. What exactly does that mean? Present truth is an aspect of the everlasting gospel that has particularly particular urgency for a specific time. And you say, what? I'll give you an example. Let's look at a couple of examples of present truth. Noah's message of the flood found in Genesis 6, 7, and it mentions it again in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Is this present truth? Was this present truth for Noah's day? See, Noah was a preacher of righteousness, wasn't he? He preached that an end was coming. Something was going to happen. There was something significant that was going to take place. He taught God's love as he warned about this coming flood that was going to destroy the world and all of the wickedness of the world. And all they had to do was walk on that ark. That's all they had to do. The flood message, the message about that flood was present truth. It was truth for that era. It was truth for those people. And it happened. And if they didn't take heed of the present truth, what happened? You were lost. It's just that simple. Now, it was truth for that time, but does that mean it's not truth today? No, it happened. It, it was truth. It was foretold, and it happened, and we look back. It's still truth today. It hasn't changed. The flood occurred. Present truth isn't changing truth. It's truth for that time that has occurred. We're living in a time of present truth. Something is about to occur. Something as significant, even more significant, than the flood. The present truth for Noah's day was the urgent cry to get on the ark. That was the door. The door to that ark was the door to salvation. Jesus Christ is the door to salvation. He's the only way that we can have it. And it was so important that it would have been impossible and irresponsible for Noah to not preach it. He had it on his heart. He had to share it. And it would have been irresponsible for him to be building this big ark and preparing for this cataclysmic event and not to be telling people about it. Are you preparing for a cataclysmic event? Are you prepared for the coming of the Lord Jesus? Another bit of evidence about present truth, Jonah's message to Nineveh. In Jonah chapter 3, verse 4, this was present truth. 
He was, he was telling people that Nineveh was about to be destroyed. They had 40 days. Jonah uplifted the Savior, Jesus Christ, and the city repented. How do I say he uplifted Christ? Because all of these things point to the salvation of Christ. All of these things teach us lessons about the coming Christ. If he would have not preached that 40-day warning, isn't it interesting? This warning was 40 days. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. Brother Rick touched on some of these things in a sermon just the other week about some of those things in the Bible that are so important that had these little timelines. And I don't know that we understand it completely. But to not give that warning would have made Jonah an unfaithful man. He didn't want to do it. Sometimes we may not want to do it. But I hope you're motivated to do it. This was present truth and it fitted that time period in a special way. The truth hasn't changed. It's still the same. We look back at it. None of that has changed. All of those beliefs are still there. We understand now what happened. They were living before that time. They, maybe some had faith and some didn't. Just like in Noah's day. Next, John the Baptist's message in Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, and Luke chapter 17. John's present truth, the truth for that day, was that Jesus, the Messiah, was about to appear. He went preaching that. His work was to present the gospel and to prepare people to accept Jesus at his first coming. And to have omitted that information from people, it would have been a dangerous thing to do. Another thing, another example of present truth is the three angels' messages that we're talking about today. So what have we done? We've, we've, we've gone all the way from the book of Genesis in, with Noah to a later part of the Old Testament in, with Jonah to the first part of the gospel message uh, that's being preached uh, by, in the New Testament with John the Baptist and now here we are at our time, the three angels' message of Revelation chapter 14. Is this present truth? Absolutely. It's present truth. God's present truth for today is contained in this message in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through 13. Of course, salvation through Jesus Christ alone is the central part of this message. That's what it is. Not salvation in sin, not salvation by works. The works come as a result of the faith that we have in Christ. And this present truth message has been given to prepare people, to get you to prepare your hearts for the second coming of Jesus. And it's to open your eyes to the deceptions that Satan uses to keep you from knowing who Christ is, that teaches a false gospel, that teaches that I can continue to live in my sin and be saved. That teaches, well, if I just go and I do enough of this or that, I'm saved. Well, if I just keep the commandments of God, I'm saved. That's what the Jews thought. But they rejected Christ. They kept the commandments, but they rejected the Son of God. Some people accept the Son of God, but they reject the commandments. Well, how can you say I'm, I have the faith of Jesus if I'm breaking the commandments? Oh, I believe in him, but I'm not doing the things that he did. That's where you're lost. We have to do what he did. He was our example. We ca we're called Christian because we follow Christ. I must do what Christ did. Did Christ keep the Ten Commandments? Yes. Did Christ keep the Sabbath day? Yes. So unless people understand these messages, Satan can deceive us in one way or another. He'll get us in the left ditch or the right ditch. He doesn't care which one it is. Jesus knew that we needed these vital messages from Revelation. And that's why in the book of Revelation, if you, if you look at it, in fact, in my Bible, I don't know what yours says, but mine, when I go to Revelation chapter 1, when I look at the header, it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's revealing Christ to us. And this is so important. And loving kindness, he has given these things to us. 
and we in turn need to give it to the rest of the world. This is the everlasting gospel that must be preached for Christ to come. And it's talked about right there in the last book of the Bible. Jesus talked about it in Matthew 24, as we've already discovered. So we can't overlook these things. Just I put a couple of slides here. Here we have Noah, this preacher of righteousness, talked about in the book of Genesis, and he's trying to tell people. He's building this ark. That was a witness in itself. And there he is. He's trying to witness and preach to people. And then what do we have? Well, as we go through this, we know what happened. A lot of people rejected, and the waters came and swept them all away. He warned them. It was present truth. He tried to tell them. All you have to do is walk through the door. Friends, that's all you have to do today is walk through the door. The door is Christ Jesus. It's not the door to this church. It's not the door to your church, wherever you are. It's Christ. He is the door. And then what do we see next? Well, you see all of the people are gone, and we see this beautiful picture there. Oh, let me make that bigger. Here we go. Can I, there we go. We see this beautiful picture. The rain has stopped. We have this, this vessel that God gave him the instructions of how to build, and only eight people got on this huge vessel. And you know, sometimes when I think about this, <clears throat> this might seem a little far for some, but I, I shared this once before. I, I can't remember if I've ever shared it here or not. But when it started raining, before it started raining, that ark was sitting on the earth. It was sitting on dry ground. It was built in the desert. So he builds this ark on dry ground, and what happens? The floods come. God's people go into the ark, and the floods come and lifts those people off of the dry ground. They stay dry. They're lifted up above the surface of the terra firma, as we would call it, the earth. Usually sea level is below, but this time sea level lifted them up above the earth. Will we not be taken up, it says in Thessalonians, and we'll be safe. Then the ark settled back on the earth. Could that be a prophecy about the things that will happen with us at the end of time? We'll be safe amidst the turmoil, we're preaching the gospel, something significant will happen. So, back to Revelation chapter 14. Let's read it. Let's read just a couple of things here, and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. Revelation chapter 14. We read through the the angel's message there, the three angels' message of Revelation 14. Let's just read it again. It's not going to hurt. So it's only take a couple of minutes. Verse 6, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water, and another angel followed, saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. I want you to notice that word rest is used at least twice in this context. And this, isn't this what the Sabbath does? It gives us rest. 
rest from our labor. And that's what this is talking about. The very commandment that most Christians neglect and most Christians overlook and most Christians don't want to hear about is right here mentioned, the rest. We will rest. And then verse 14, Then I looked and behold a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, and the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now, when I go into my garden and I reap, I don't know about you, but I take the vegetables out. We read in 1 Thessalonians that God's people are taken up. They're taken out, right? We're taken out of this mess for a while. But notice verse 17. Then another angel came out of the temple which was in heaven, and he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from that altar who had power over fire. And he cried with a loud voice to him who had a sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust, in, thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and the blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furlongs. So obviously, these grapes of wrath are those who are not God's people. And then we look at the reaping of the earth's harvest are the reaping of God's people. Which side do you want to be on? Do you want to be, do you want to walk through the door like those who walk through the door to get on the ark to be saved? The ark is Christ Jesus. The door is Christ Jesus. This is the only way to salvation. It's the only way. And these are vital messages from Revelation. Angels are involved. Angels are directing this gospel being preached to all of the world today. Angels were involved in those days. Remember, we're still living in biblical times, friends, because all of this hasn't been fulfilled. We are still living in Bible times. So don't have the mindset of, well, back in Bible times, this miracle and that miracle, and they were involved and healings took place. I'm telling you, those things go on today. You're just not in tune with it. We're just not looking. We're not seeing it because we're not paying attention. Miracles are happening every single day all around us. And we're just not paying attention. So my prayer is that this lecture helps you a little bit to understand that angels are directly involved in the preaching of the gospel. This message has to go out. And before Christ can come, it has to be done to the satisfaction of the Father. Judgment is closed. Judgment is sealed. Your judgment has been sealed before Christ comes back because he has to know who are his. So we need to be ready. And the only way we can be ready is by leaning on the Father and His Son and trusting in them.